Um, you know, very little time, I'm afraid, to speak. And the truth is, I could speak this half an hour just about what's already been said. There's been some really great things said that I'd like to kind of uh, elaborate on or say something more. And I just, we'll see how much we can say in a short amount of time. But as, uh, as Sam started, I need to also make some notes. And that is, uh, in this statement I made, by the way, is kind of something you actually hear at a potlatch from old time people or really anybody following our protocols. And that is, uh, I have a few words before I speak, which is what I said in Chinook. Um, and, and, you know, uh, also enumerate uh, ancestry because uh, this is what we do, and I'd be in trouble if I didn't. So my dad's name is Gary Johnson. And uh, his father was Farrell Johnson, whose mother was uh, Lizzie Pickernell. And Elizabeth Pickernell's mom was uh, uh, Margaret Arrow. And Margaret Arrow's uh, mother was a woman named Eclisic. Her father was a man named uh, Urbane Arrow, which some of you may know because he's who killed uh, John McLaughlin Jr. at Fort Stikeen in Alaska. So I can proudly say my grandfather killed the uh, son of the father of Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am on a t-shirt, actually. <laughs> and he, you know, then uh, Lizzie Pickernell's uh, father was a person named John Pickernell Jr., whose mother was Tanwa, who uh, also has a connection to those people. But uh, uh, her mother and father were mostly from the Oregon side of the river, Clatsops and Tillamooks. Um, the e Eclisic that I mentioned, her family's primarily uh, Kuniak and Wakayakum. Um, that is, uh, you know, just up from the mouth of Columbia River on the North Shore. Um, certainly, though, we all have uh, connections and ancestry through uh, Chehalis and Willapa Bay, the lower Columbia River, and up and then south into Tillamook country. Uh, my wife is also uh, been a, is a tribal member, and uh, her ancestry is mostly on the Oregon side. She's descendant of Chief Washington, who was a treaty signer for the one of the Anson Dart treaties in 1851 that was referred to earlier. I should also say that uh, Eclisic that I named her father was uh, Oskal Willick. She also signed uh, one of the Anson Dart treaties in 1851. So, you know, these are our connections. This is uh, ultimately why we have a right to stand up here and speak. That's why we name these uh, folks that we descend from. Um, I did work for something like 15 years in uh, Grand Round. That is for the Confederated Tribes of Grand Round. I went to work there and ultimately uh, am doing what I do because of being inspired by some really good uh, elders, old time people from our community. I was born in Willapa Bay and had the benefit of being around people that were really uh, knowledgeable, um, you know, very, very aware of their own history, our Aboriginal history. Something that I'll say now just so I don't have to later is that, you know, our history is, and it was said really well earlier, is not. Uh, this, this new history is not very deep. So my dad's grandmother, for instance, you know, lived in a village where there was no road. Uh, she lived at Pillar Rock on the Columbia River. Her parents, uh, you know, had basically first-hand memories of the, of, you know, this place without any non-natives here. The person that was my primary teacher and also you know, I carry his name, that is Tony. Uh, his name's Tony Lucier. Uh, he is who I'd credit my knowledge of the Chinookwawa language. Uh, you know, I'll give him credit for that. And uh, he, he was my grandfather's best friend, by the way. My grandpa and his brothers and sisters all had a good working knowledge of this language. But Tony was very unique because his mother, Tony, by the way, we call his name Sato Anuk. Uh, well, he had two names. Wahawa was another name. That's actually a big chief's name from around here, by the way. But his, uh, you know, his mother was very unique in that she didn't, uh, pretty much never spoke English to him. She was very strict about that. 
where most people were getting into positions where they had to uh, be speaking English all the time. Tony's mom didn't do that to him, uh, kept him very isolated, and he ended up knowing five uh, different languages as an adult. And that's not that unusual in our old history, but it's, of course, unusual in America now. Uh, but Tony had his mother doing that, and then also his grandparents around him uh, as a youngster. And because of his knowledge with language, and just the general way that he was raised up, he was around a lot of the uh, real old time people. So his grandparents had firsthand stories of the first ships on the Columbia River, for instance. Uh, that's a story I was fortunate to hear from Tony more than once. But anyway, he, you know, this is uh, my, my good fortune, basically, to have known these people. And uh, I was probably a strange kid and went out of my way to hang out around and be around these folks. Uh, in fact, you know, I spent uh, quite a few years just in the nursing home with, uh, with Tony, for instance. But because of getting this information and knowledge and what have you, I was uh, invited to go to work in Grand Round, where at that time there were no speakers of Chinook Wawa uh, that were anywhere near my age, pretty much the speakers were the same as in our own community, which were, you know, 70, 80, and 90-year-old people. Uh, but I was able to move to Grand Round and then learn the variety of the language there, and over the course of time start a language immersion school so that we had a school going, or the school still going, uh, where kids would start school 30 days before their uh, three and could go through all their preschool, go through kindergarten, and then, you know, entirely immersed, no, no English allowed at all. And then uh, a maintenance program for the kids K-5, and then, you know, just, there's been a number of things happening there. This is all really important stuff to me. It's also a great frustration to me because at some point, you know, it, it became very difficult to grow the school in the way that I think many of us would like it to have grown. That is, we really do want at least kids going through the, at least the eighth grade, and really I'll say at least through puberty, speaking their language because there's something <laughs> about uh, puberty that locks a language in your mind differently than, uh, you know, kids learn language really well, but they also forget language really quickly. So, you know, if you can get a, a kid through a certain age, and we know this through experience because our elders, you know, many of them only spoke their language in the context of their grandparents or, you know, a parent or what have you. And as soon as they moved out of the house, married early, whatever, they weren't using the language and, you know, yet they maintain it really well. So that's a, a personal goal. And even though I moved away from the Confederated Tribes of Grand Round, and I moved to Shoalwater Bay, which is, you know, the only recognized group of Chinooks, and it's kind of an odd little story, and I'll say something about it, that is there was basically a family of rank and a few people associated with them living on a location on the north end of Willapa Bay where the government wanted to build a lighthouse. And basically, in trade for the land they were on, they were given a one square mile reservation the reservation was never really a highly prized place to be. It was a town named Namschatz. There was always a town there, and so there were always people there, and there have always been people there since. But most of the people, including that family that was uh, the originators of the reservation, really, they've almost all lived over in the community where Sam's ancestors and my ancestors have been, which is Bay Center uh, in Willapa Bay. 